The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, a foot soldier in the fight for civil rights. I never faced that much meaning hatred before. One hero remembers the days of segregation. They would take you home, your property. They would even burn it down. His march from Selma. I came so close to being killed today. And into the history books. That was our biggest, biggest victory. That we defeated Jim Crow. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. You know, there's only one way to get rid of a thug, and that's at the point of a gun. It's a shame that it has to be that way, but Maduro is making it impossible to have a peaceful resolution of what's going on in Venezuela. He actually set fire, had his people set fire to a convoy of humanitarian aid, foodstuffs, and medicine that were coming in to help his beleaguered people. And it's 2 million percent inflation. It's just a shocking what's going on. And now uh, there's gas and gunfire and those weapons that were used to stop a humanitarian convoy from entering Venezuela. Hundreds have been wounded. Many are dead. We've got to get in there with troops, the whole thing. What happened in Panama is easy to do. And it's time for those people know the day of reckoning has come. And we need to be the hammer of justice. And I know we don't want to get involved, but the, the nations and, and President Guido is asking for help. And I think he's actually called for military intervention. We need to help him. Terry. Well, now Maduro is sealing off the borders to prevent more aid from entering the country. Meanwhile, Vice President Pence will meet with Venezuela's opposition leader Juan Guaido in Colombia. Chuck Holton has the story from the Colombia-Venezuelan border. Pandemonium over the weekend as the supporters of interim President Juan Guaido attempted to get truckloads of humanitarian aid into Venezuela from Colombia and Brazil. National Guard troops loyal to dictator Nicolas Maduro blocked bridges to stop the aid, which Maduro claims is part of a U.S.-led coup against him. Lester Toledo, a representative of Guaido's party, leads the effort to get across the border. Days earlier, he talked of success. 23 of Ferrari in this bridge, you will you going to be uh, a witness of a humanitarian tsunami that will be around here and we're, going, we're coming into Venezuela with this humanitarian aid. But things didn't go as planned. Saturday, thousands of desperate Venezuelans, led by Juan Guaido himself, tried to run the blockades and deliver 235 tons of American aid to their countrymen. By mid-afternoon, the effort fell apart as Venezuelan forces torched four aid trucks and fired tear gas at hungry protesters. Just across the border, Criminal gangs loyal to Maduro looted stores and attacked those supporting the aid effort. As hopes for change went up in smoke, protesters expressed frustration with the Venezuelan troops standing against them. We beg the National Guard to put themselves on the side of the Venezuelans. To think of your children, think of your families. Here on the Colombian side of the border, you can see there's an incredible marketplace and lots of fruits and vegetables and everything for sale. In Venezuela, what we're being told is that there's absolutely nothing. So the question is, when is the military going to relent and stop supporting Maduro because he won't allow any of the products to come into Venezuela? And I just spoke with the wife of a military officer who told me off camera that the Venezuelan military officers really don't support Maduro. The question is, who's going to be the first guy to stand up to a dictator? Other Venezuelans told us, though the aid hasn't yet made it, they're grateful for the American support. I know that God is with us all the time, and um, we are. We have to tell you thank you, thank you uh, to the American people, uh, because we need you. We need you really. Chuck Holton, CBN News, Cucuta, Colombia. Excellent, Chuck. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I remember years ago when I uh, was at Yale uh, studying about Caracas, Venezuela. It was a model of a beautiful city. They had lovely um, roadways coming in. 
They had beautiful buildings. Everything about that country was, was a, a, a model. They were, had so much oil wealth, probably one of the biggest oil deposits in the entire world. Everything was running so smoothly. And then that uh, communist, uh, uh, socialist, whatever you want to call him, Chavez took over in a military coup. And then he turned the nation into a nightmare. He closed down major oil companies, uh, ruined the oil sector, uh, has imperiled all of the uh, financials of the country. And then after he uh, died, uh, in his place, they put in this uh, former, what was he, a cab driver or something, a mechanic, uh, Maduro, who knows nothing about government. And suddenly he's in charge of the country. And the Venezuelan people are suffering a huge humanitarian crisis. The time has come for military intervention. We cannot allow this to continue. It's like a cancer. Sooner or later, the cancer has got to be cut out. And meanwhile, the Trump administration is rationing up pressure on Maduro. John Jessup has that story. That's right, Pat. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says Maduro's days are numbered. Fox News Sunday host Chris Wallace asked Pompeo how far the administration is prepared to go. But no military force. We've said every option's on the table. We're going to do the things that need to be done to make sure that the Venezuelan people's voice, that democracy reigns, and that there's a brighter future for the people of Venezuela. All right, let's... I had a Florida Senator Marco Rubio sent his own message Sunday, tweeting a picture of former Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega before and after he was overthrown by U.S. forces. Rubio did not include any text with the picture, but some see it as a not-so-subtle message to Maduro about his fate if he doesn't step down. President Trump is preparing for round two with North Korea in his second summit with dictator Kim Jong-un in Vietnam this week. It comes at a time, the same time rather, he faces challenges at home over his national emergency declaration and ongoing investigations. Amber Strong reports. The president arrives in Hanoi for a two-day summit with Kim Jong-un Tuesday. He's still pressing the regime to give up their nuclear weapons, but says he's proud of the progress he's made so far. There's been no nuclear testing, no missiles, no rockets. We got our hostages back. Even still, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the demand for complete denuclearization remains. There's been no change in U.S. policy since the time I've been Secretary of State. Our objectives are clear. Our mission is clear. Democrats say the president needs to walk away with a verifiable inspection program. Nothing is clear. Uh, and I think as a result, um, we could run the risk uh, that Kim is given concessions, which are not accompanied by real concessions. Meanwhile, in the background of the international talks, Congress has a few questions for the president's former attorney, Michael Cohen. Why the false statements before our committee when he first appeared? Uh, did they go beyond what he told us about Moscow Trump Tower? Cohen will appear before three committees this week. The House will also be busy with a resolution to block the president's national emergency declaration over the border wall. Some GOP lawmakers are undecided about how they'll vote. I don't know yet. I don't like the process. I don't think that the emergency declaration law was written to deal with things that the president asked the Congress to do. Regardless, the president vows to veto the resolution. One thing that isn't likely to happen this week, the release of the Mueller report. Democrats say the public has a right to know what's inside, and they're going to release the report, even if they have to subpoena it or call Mueller to testify. Amber Strong, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Amber. Pat, a lot going on internationally and domestically this week. There is. I, I think with that question, we've been saying all along that, that Mueller, uh, he's run to the end of his stuff. And Adam Schiff, frankly, just makes me sick at my stomach. Every time I hear what he has to say, it is so biased and so ridiculous. And now he wants to have hearings about stuff that went on before the president was elected. And what about uh, uh, building uh, hotels in Russia and so forth? It's just nonsense. And uh, it's time that that uh, witch hunt get finished. Uh, I think we're not talking too much about the fact that the man at the White House who was, I mean, at the Justice Department, who's responsible for setting that uh, a course of action of a special uh, counselor, He's uh, resigned. I don't know if they've got anybody to fill his place yet. I don't think so. But uh, 
uh, it means that the new um, uh, secretary, I mean, the, the new Justice Department head has just been confirmed by the Senate, and he is a very uh, respected gentleman, and I think it will be some good stuff. But I tell you, in terms of this Maduro thing, without question, it's going to take military force. And it's just as well we, we, we get in, in the Senate, we say, well, we don't want to be uh, condemned as the North American conqueror and so forth. But when the uh, acting president of the country calls on you to help him militarily, you have every right to go in and do it. And I think that we can't let those people suffer anymore. That Maduro has got to go, and he's got to understand what's going to happen. And I think the sooner he's captured, put in jail, uh, have a trial for his war crimes, and they are serious, I think the message will go out to these potential thugs who would take control of countries. Well, there's something else we need to consider that has been so grievous to all of us. That is the incredible, incredible sex scandal going on in the Catholic Church. Pedophiles, uh, nuns who claim that they're having affairs with others, uh, priests that are ch uh, siring children though they're not supposed to be married. It just goes on and on. And John has more about that. It's a shocking thing, but apparently the, the, the Pope is trying to get it, uh, his arms around the matter and clean it up. John? Thanks, Pat. Pope Francis condemned pedophile priests at the conclusion of a global summit on sex abuse in the Catholic Church. The Pope labeled predator priests tools of Satan. He also vowed to confront abusers with, quote, the wrath of God and make victims the priority. Abuse victims are calling for strong action, not just words. Well, the city of Philadelphia may boot out a Catholic foster care agency for its policy of not placing children with same-sex couples, even at a time when the city desperately needs foster care help. But as Paul Strand reports, Philadelphia may be willing to lose this faith-based agency because of its religious belief. Much like the rest of the country, Philadelphia faces a challenge when it comes to finding homes for children. In March, it put out an urgent call for 300 foster families. At the same time, however, it demanded that Catholic social services endorse same-sex relationships or be ousted from their contract to do foster care business with the city. Catholic Social Services has been serving the city of Philadelphia for over 100 years, and they've been doing that consistent with their religious mission since then. Um, but the city has said that if they want to continue working, they have to endorse same-sex relationships, which is the one thing they're not able to do. In court, lawyers at the Beckett Fund pointed out Catholic Social Services helped 2,200 foster children last year alone. So banning this agency is going to harm many children and the foster families who need the agency's help caring for those kids. It's hurting families like plaintiff uh, Miss Sharon L. Fulton, who's fostered over 40 children in the past 25 years and has said she'd be devastated if, if Catholic closed. Catholic Social Services trains, supports, and provides ongoing uh, advice and help to families like Miss Fulton. They have social workers who are on call 24-7. Regarding the decision, Fulton wrote in the Philadelphia Inquirer, as a single mom and woman of color, I've known a thing or two about discrimination over the years, but I have never known vindictive religious discrimination like this, and I feel the fresh sting of bias watching my faith publicly derided by Philadelphia's politicians. Reeves points out Philadelphia is booting Catholic Social Services, though not one same-sex couple has complained about the agency. There's a clear foster care crisis, and 35 beds are sitting empty today because the city won't work with an effective foster care agency. Though this one is battling back in Philadelphia, other faith-based agencies have given up and closed down in Boston, Washington, D.C., Buffalo, and throughout Illinois, rather than endorse same-sex relationships. As for Catholic Social Services, they say they won't give up and they'll continue to fight on because the one thing they can't do is endorse relationships that aren't consistent with their religious beliefs. Paul Strand, CBN News. Thanks, Paul. Pat, religious discrimination, strong words from that single mother. Well, the incredible thing about the homosexuals is they are willing to destroy lives and destroy the whole fabric of society so long as they and their weird way of doing sex is, is, is legitimized. That's what they want, and they will it, it take away everything. They'll destroy marriage, they'll destroy families, they'll destroy, um, the uh, in this case, the foster children. They're willing to tear down the entire edifice 
in order to have the, the majority of people recognize the way they do sex. That's what it amounts to. And 1%, ladies and gentlemen, get it, 1% of the country from what we understand are lesbian, 2% are homosexuals. And that is all. And yet that 2% and 1% are taking charge of the rest of us because they're so vocal and so authoritative and they apparently dominate these legislative bodies. I think if Christians begin to speak out and insist that if some politician goes along with the gay agenda, that they're going to be voted out of office. And once they get that message, they'll start saying, well, we want to listen to the majority of the people in our society. Until they do, that small minority is going to be dominating everything we do in every aspect of our lives. Mark my word, it's going to happen. Terry. Well, coming up, a firefighter who was once called on to douse the flames of hatred. Oh my God, I came so close to being killed today. I, this is real, I had to make a decision. Well, I was going to continue to quit. And it's in my spirit and heart, I said, no, you continue. Hear how this civil rights icon helped defeat Jim Crow. That's next. There's some real brave heroes living among us in sometimes relative obscurity. Henry Allen is one. Henry risked his life in those days just by walking down the street. That's how it went for young black men in the Deep South during the era of Jim Crow. Henry was surrounded by racists. Some of those racists had badges. Some were riding on horseback. And still, Henry was determined to win the fight for civil rights, which is why he defied the hatred that he faced and marched toward the Capitol. Watch this. When I found those state troopers, I never faced that much meaning hatred before. Then I began to see the real true hatred that would come out of a man. They were like, they wouldn't take my life. Born and raised in Selma, Alabama, Henry Allen grew up in a neighborhood where diversity was not only normal, it was welcomed. I'm living in a, a, a white neighborhood and we're all poor. And we sharing a lot of things together, and that was never fight. That was never no hatred going on within us. We never saw any color because we didn't enjoy each other. But skirting the edges of his neighborhood was a century of legal racism. Alabama state and local officials prescribed to the laws of Jim Crow, which enforced racial segregation and voter restrictions. Henry never questioned it until his junior year of high school when he met Bernard Lafayette, the leader of a student nonviolent coordinating committee. And he started demonstrating and telling us the 14th and 15th Amendment, citizenship and right to vote. Everything that they've done was to deny you opportunity to vote to become a first class citizen. I was more or less at a, at a stage of amazement about what is going on, eyes being opened up. Growing up in Jim Crowism, you didn't know a lot, you weren't told a lot about it, Nobody really want to talk about it. Henry soon became a foot soldier with the civil rights movement, standing Some up to Christian Selma's leadership. own sheriff, Jim Clark, and his rally of white supremacists. He's in my, as being the law said, that you're never going to vote, I'm going to make sure you're not going to vote. Your clerk or claim was your, this was your white city council. They were your druggers, they were your, they were your car dealer, they were your business people. This was a form of intimidation. This is what this was all about, to put fear in the ear. They would take you home, your property. They would even burn it down. It could even cost your life. It was a risk that became a reality for Henry. One afternoon, while walking to Brown Chapel Church for a protest, he encountered three state troopers on horseback. Instantly, they pursued him. With the grace of God, I would outrun three horses down that sidewalk. Henry escaped into a stranger's home. I said, oh my God. I came so close to being killed today. I said, this is no fun. This is real. I had to make a decision whether I was going to continue to quit. And it's in my spirit and heart, I said, no, you continue. On March 7th, 1965, 
600 peaceful protesters attempted a march from Selma to Montgomery. Under the directives of Governor George Wallace, Alabama state troopers blocked their march on the far side of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. When the men and women refused to disband, Sheriff Clark gave the order to attack. Dozens were wounded and one was killed in what the world came to know as Bloody Sunday. They wanted violence. Dr. Queen said, no, we're going to stick to non-violence. And then now we are, we are going to Montgomery and we're going to tell the Governor Wallace that how we feel about it's what he's done to the black people. We are killing segregation. Two weeks later, Martin Luther King led Henry and 25,000 other protesters from the bridge in Selma to the Capitol in Montgomery. The following August, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law. If any county anywhere in this nation does not want federal intervention, it need only open its polling places to all of its people. A slight pride because we had, we had had a victory over Jim Crow. And so that was our, that was our biggest, biggest victory, that we had defeated Jim Crow. In 1972, Henry again defied segregation, becoming Selma's first African-American firefighter. I wasn't just, just a firefighter. This was a planned thing by God that I had to come back to Selma and be the first black firefighter. Henry later became the first African-American chief, this time with a unanimous vote by the Selma City Council. I said, God, you're putting me in a position here that I'm really gonna need your help. It was a tremendous struggle because the man who I was replacing was a racist. And he had polarized the whole department with racism. And the Spirit of God said, well, you need to go and talk to him. We call him minister. As administrator, you have this whole organization full of racism. You've got certain equipment that whites work off of. You've got certain equipment that blacks work off of. We want, we want something better than this right here. He said, I hadn't thought that way. Now that you brought him my attention, I'm gonna try my best to fix what's broken. And he did. I wanted what's right for everybody. They saw me as a leader, not just a fire chief. They saw me as a leader. Now a retiree, Henry continues to fight against division. As the PTO president of his alma mater, he serves the youth of Selma, reminding them how far we've come and how much further we need to go. I'm seeing a lot of reverse discrimination that I don't like. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of bitterness. I'm still, we got a lot of people that are still toting this anger. And I, I'm troubled about this kind of spirit because it's not good for America. As far as he sees it, there is only one bridge that can bring this country together. This bridge right here represents freedom. But the most important bridge of all that it, it, it's across over is from sin into a perfect relationship with, with Jesus Christ as your personal savior. I want to come to raise the land but one people. Jesus Christ has died for sins of the whole entire world. There's no discrepancy, no individuality. So in order to, to love Jesus Christ, you got to be love your brother and your sisters. Is that we have to show love for all mankind. Wouldn't it be nice if we followed Henry's advice? It was the advice of Jesus. It's so clear, you know. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and all your mind. And then he said, and your neighbor is yourself. And once we begin to, that's called the golden rule. And if we, we do unto others as we'd have them do unto us, what a wonderful world we'll have. And that's, oh, it's just simple. It's just simple stuff that the Lord himself gave us. And Henry is a living example of it. And God bless him. All right, Terry. Well, up next, a man is tormented by a painful rash. I was miserable. I'm scratching all the time. It got so bad, I had to go to the emergency room. Doctors couldn't help him, but you'll see how he was supernaturally healed right after this. You know, if you're healthy, things kind of go pretty well for you. But just think of somebody that's not healthy, somebody that's suffering all the time. Now, look at Joe Marinelli. 
Joel was taking a dozen Advil pills a day. Plus, he was taking 10 Benadryl tablets just to take the edge off the agonizing itching that from a, a rash that he suffered. He suffered so much, he said, I can't stand to go on living. And then one morning, he found relief. Joe Marinelli has been running a successful painting business since 2010. But in 2016, after his mother died, he was under a lot of stress, which caused him to break out with an itchy and painful rash. I was miserable. I'm scratching all the time. And when I go to bed at night, I'm scratching. I'd had a back scratcher. I practically wore out two back scratchers with that. I broke out really bad across the top of my shoulders. I had it along my sides. It got so bad, I had to go to the emergency room. Joe was given antifungal cream and other meds, but nothing seemed to work. So he took painkillers just so he could manage going to work and sleep through the night. I was pumping 12 to 15 Advils a day just to try to keep my itching down to where I can bear it. And I was taking 10 Benadryls a day at the same time. As time went on, the rash got worse. When I was itching, these things would spread and it would like, I would scratch with my fingernails or I would get in the shower and I would just scratch with a back scratcher to try to relieve that itching and it would bleed. My shoulders all across the back of my shoulders in the middle of my back and then, then it went around my waist. I felt like if somebody saw me with my shirt off, I would be, I would be afraid because they would say something that was that bad. It looked like I had, you know, some kind of very bad disease on my body. Joe began praying desperately for God's help. I was crying out to the Lord so much about this. I found myself on my knees constantly praying and asking God what's going on. And I, I said, Lord, I, I, I don't know if I can go on like this anymore. That's how bad it was. Then one morning while watching the 700 Club, Joe heard Terry Mewson praying. There's someone else you have. This is so I don't know what this is, a subcutaneous infection. And it is both painful and itchy. It spreads. Um, across the top of your skin, the evidence of it, nothing has seemed to stop it. But today is your day. Jesus is healing you right now. Just receive that. I was jumping up and down and I said, praise God. And I said, thank you. That's for me. I'm taking it. I'm claiming that. That's mine. That's my word, you know. Over the next few days, the rash began to heal. I felt like this weight was lifted off of me. And I said, I'm receiving what that word said and I'm believing what the Word said. And I went to work and I just started doing my daily process stuff and I noticed I didn't have to scratch as much. It was starting to go little by little diminishing. I, I started seeing this stuff just start to disappear. It started to just fade away. By the next week, God healed Joe completely. I feel lifted up. I feel like I can do more things. I feel free. You have to believe and you have to ask God to help you believe that His Word is what brings healing. Take the healing scriptures, apply those to your life every day, and continue to press into that. And when you do that, the Word of God will transform your life and it will bring healing into your life. Terry, by the way, you didn't know Joe Marinelli, did you? I still don't know Joe Marinelli, but I sure am happy for you, Joe. <laughs> but you had a word about a subcutaneous infection. Yeah, I, you know, sometimes something comes to you while we're praying, yeah. and you don't even know if it's legitimate or not. Well, you know? <laughs> in that case, it was legitimate. Here's one. Beverly, who lives in Kissimmee, Florida, was experiencing an annoying crinkling sound in her ear. Crinkling. She was watching the 700 Club, and Terry said, you have a condition in your ear, and you've had it for a long time. There's a crinkling, almost like plastic. And Beverly said, that's me, and that went away. Praise God. Well, this is Glenda. She lives in Rockingham, North Carolina. For six months, she'd choke on her food every time she ate. So one day when she was watching this program, Pat, you had this word. There's someone with inflammation of the throat. It's swollen. It feels thick. You're hardly able to swallow. She claimed the word. She was able to eat dinner a few hours later. She's not had any choking problems since then. Praise the Lord. Folks, I want you to know something. We deal with a God who is a supernatural being. He has all power. I'm not talking about a little bit of power. He's got it all. He created everything, and He made you and me. He formed us. He created us, and He can sustain us, and He can certainly heal us. So when he, we speak His Word, things happen. 
Now, Terry and I are going to join together right now, and I want to pray for you, and I want you to believe God. While we talk, the God of heaven wants to see you whole, and we're going to believe God for his mercy. Father, I join with Terry right now, and we pray for the people in this audience who are suffering, people with arthritis. Their joints are swollen, and they can hardly move. Lord, you are healing that arthritis. Somebody with asthma is being healed. You can hardly breathe, but God right now is opening up your airways and that condition is leaving you. In the name of Jesus, a toenail fungus is being healed, completely healed right now. Terry, what are you in? Someone else, you have um, like these little blisters on your eyes, it, but they're like ulcers inside the lining of your eyelid, and God is healing that for you. All that feeling that you have something in your eye is just going to go away as it comes, becomes completely healthy. Thank you. There's a couple, I believe, Margie and Paul, uh, your, your uh, marriage is getting busted up. And God is going to bring your marriage together, and he's going to fill your hearts with love. And all that's gone before is going to be taken care of. And there's going to be, instead of hatred and bitterness, there's going to be love. Receive it and claim it in Jesus' name. Yeah, there's, now, yes, yeah, there's someone else. I want to say, you've had a farm accident injury, not recently, but before the weather turned bad, but you've had trouble with it healing. God's healing that for you right Thank now. You. Just receive it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name right now, may the anointing of the Lord Thank touch you. you. Receive an answer. Amen. amen. And amen. amen. Okay, Terry. Well, still ahead, Pat weighs in on your most pressing issues. Gary says, I've been drinking a bottle of red wine a day. Is that healthy? <laughs> well, another round of your questions and some honest answers is next, so don't go away. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Tornadoes, floods, and blizzards, they're the latest in extreme winter weather across the nation. A Mississippi woman died after five different tornadoes ripped across the South. One big twister caught on video plowing a path of destruction. More than a foot of rain flooded streets in Nashville, turning them into makeshift rivers. And blizzard conditions in the Midwest created multiple accidents and brought traffic to a standstill. One of CBN's most popular programs is getting a name change. Known for 20 years as Turning Point International, the award-winning show has changed its name to TPI. The show also is introducing viewers to several new segments, including The Love Seat, the segment shows real couples who reflect on solutions that have helped them grow in their marriage. The goal of the segment is to help marriages around the world and point them to Christ. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. Peru, a mother and her two daughters struggled to put food on their table. But then people like you taught them how to run a business. The result, this family has more than enough to eat and they're building a sustainable income. Take a look. 12 year old Nora knew her mom was struggling to feed her and her sister. So she tried to find ways to help. I asked my aunt if we could climb her tree to pick fruit to sell. It was dangerous, but I knew I had to do something. Nora and her sister collected and sold 35 pounds of fruit that day. I showed the money to my mom and she said, where did you get this? And I told her what we did. I felt so desperate when I thought about them working to provide food for us. After the money was gone, the family struggled with hunger once again. That's when Operation Blessing stepped in. We trained Gisela and the girls over a three-month period how to raise and care for chickens and how to run a poultry business. At first I was nervous, but then we got the hang of it. We learned how to raise them, feed them, and keep them healthy. At the end of the training, Operation Blessing gave Gisela and the girls 100 baby chicks, a chicken coop, feed, and medicine. It's been more than a year since we gave the family that first batch of chickens. Gisela said they've earned more than $900 profit from the sales. Now they all have plenty to eat, 
and have even saved enough to put a new roof on their house. Thank you for helping us to move forward. Thanks, Operation Blessing, for the chickens and for helping us to have food to eat. The dignity that comes from training, running your own business, providing what your family needs, it's all part of what happens when you join the 700 Club. You know, poverty is such an issue around the world and it destroys families. We say thank you for allowing us to come into the needs of families just like the family you just saw and give them a life that's fulfilling, that's promising, and that is filled with dignity. Joining the 700 Club is so simple. It's a phone call away. Our phone call is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000, easy to remember. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. So we want to invite you to do that today. Join with thousands of us who are out to change the world through the kind of story you just saw, as well as other options with education, with uh, training, with providing food and water, clean drinking water for people. It's all part of what you do when you're a 700 Club member. And listen, when you join, our way of saying thank you to you for caring about others is to send you Pat's latest teaching. It's called The I Wills of God from Psalm 91. You're going to love it. I want you to hear what Minnie from Winston, North Carolina had to say about it. She said, thank you so much for the I Wills of God DVD. It really opened up our eyes to how God will take care of us in any situation and whatever we face in life. We'd read Psalm 91 so many times, but never had it explained to us so clearly. This has been a great help to us, great job. We want you to have that as well. So the I Wills of God goes out to you when you call and join the 700 Club today. Thank you in advance. In advance. Ready Sorry. for some email? Let's do some. Okay. Pat, this first one comes from Gary who says, I know you know a lot about health. I've been drinking a bottle of red wine every day for two weeks. Is that healthy? Well, you know, uh, red wine has what's called resveratrol, and that's a healthy uh, antioxidant. Uh, but a glass or two of red wine is probably a pretty good thing. A bottle of it. The French have something called maladie du foie, which means cirrhosis of the liver. <laughs> you, you, you drink. That's you, not glamorous. Yeah, <laughs> maladie du foie. I've got it. All right. You you drink a bottle of red wine every day, and you're going to wow. get cirrhosis of the liver. It is not healthy, and you're like an alcoholic. So, mm -hmm. no. But resveratrol, a glass or two of red wine along with a meal, no problem. All right. This is a viewer who says, a longtime friend confided in me regarding a struggle she's had for a long time. She remembers as a child stealing candy from a store. Her problem has continued through adulthood and has grown into stealing more valuable things. She's stolen from her jobs, her family, and many other places. How do I help her? And do I report her? She's in her 60s. Well, uh, that's called kleptomania, and uh, it is a, a, a disease uh, that people, they, they don't really need to steal stuff. They just do it. You know, there's some wealthy people who go in and just steal yes. things mm -hmm. because of a compulsion. She needs professional help. She's not to, she needs to have psychological help and spiritual help to get over that. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of reporting her and getting her arrested. It's not going to do any good, but I, th I think something like that would be a help. Okay, this is Jeffrey who says, I seem to be at a point of not being able to make friends. I go out of my apartment and try my best to have fun, but seem to get nowhere. Do you think this is a test from God to see what's in my heart and protecting me from bad friends and relationships? Um, I think, you know, the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear, for fear has torment. Uh, you have a fear of meeting people and why do you have that fear? Is because you're concerned about yourself. And what will they think about me? Am I going to make the right impression on them? And you, you sort of need to say, I've got one audience. I mean, I have one person I'm performing for, and that is God Almighty. And if my ways please Him, He'll make my enemies be at peace with me. And you need to ask the Lord to set you free from this stuff. But what it amounts to, in the, in the bottom analysis, you are concerned about you. You're concerned about your image. What do people think about you? And that's, you know, they call that agoraphobia. I mean, you want some fancy names, but the, naming it doesn't help you. What you need to do is to say, how can I love other people? And I think, you know, one way to overcome this, go to a food kitchen or someplace that helps the poor and watch their reaction when you give them food. 
when you go down to the union mission or whatever is in your town and say, how can I help people? And you go to some elderly family or you go to some uh, widow who's by herself and you come in and you say, I just want to tell you I love you. You can't imagine what that will do. Uh, so reach out, help others, and forget about yourself, all right? Good advice. This is from Mitchell who says, Pat, do we pick our own soulmate or does God do that for us? I don't know anything in the Bible that indicates there's such a thing as a soulmate. I mean, I know people talk about a soulmate. That means somebody you really are compatible with. And I think God does help you find the right mate. He, he puts the lonely into families. And uh, when I look back over the fact, uh, I've been married for 64 years, and I, I, when I think of, of the children we've had, and I realize that God himself put me together with my wife because he saw what the union of our natures would be. We now, we've got 14 children, no, four children, 14 grandchildren, 14 great, almost 14 great grandchildren. Wow. And all these children are just wonderful and they love the Lord. And I see that God himself saw in that. But you talk about soulmate, I, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Look long and hard. <laughs> well, I do know compatible. And the secret, I tell men, the secret of, of a happy marriage is what will make you happy, dear. Just keep those words in mind. <laughs> That's all you got to... It's worked for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it works forever. What will make you happy, dear. That's all you need to remember. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the time we have for now, but thank you for your questions. We always love hearing from you. Well, as a child, Paul Ernst had an innate love of science that stayed with him throughout adulthood. He had no interest in faith and thought of Christians as silly. But that began to change when Paul turned 50 and suddenly he developed a fear of what might lie beyond the grave. Paul Ernst has always been a deep thinker, whether it was science or philosophy. He was the one constantly asking why and how. When Paul was a child, he gravitated towards science. And I liked knowing how things worked. I wanted to drill down to the basis of something, whether it was to, you know, like taking apart an alarm clock or later a motorcycle or a car engine. Paul excelled in science and his thirst for knowledge grew. Throughout high school and college, he studied humanism and materialism. He majored in chemistry but philosophy was his main area of interest. And so even though I might think about where the universe came from, where there's a God, is there a life after death, um, I pushed those into unknowables. The picture I had of Christians is that since they weren't in the science, they were in another realm that was unknowable. And some of it actually looked kind of silly to me that uh, you know, I just wasn't interested in that. Throughout his 40s, Paul's worldview remained secular, totally anti-religious. Then something happened. The Big 5-0, 50 years old. Paul's mortality, which was once irrelevant, now had new meaning. I have a fear of dying. I don't want to go into oblivion or even, or worse yet, into some kind of judgment. A friend of Paul, Tom Anderson, wrote a paper called, An Attorney Gives a Defense of the Deity of Christ. Paul read it, and he took it to heart. I knew if this is true, this changes everything. This is huge. So I could immediately tell that this, this was something big that needed to be pursued. But the bigger part of the picture is this individual had a roadmap for connecting the dots to where I at first time saw the possibility of knowing whether it was true or not. And I thought, I'm not going to live forever. Maybe I better look into these things and settle them. Then, another friend gave Paul a book called The Case for Christ. The book interviews Christian scholars on various topics like the resurrection, the reliability of the text, as though this investigative reporter, Lee Strobel, is interviewing these different experts. And so I begin to mimic the process of what I see going on in the case for Christ. And it sort of put me into, you know, some turmoil. Is it true? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And that went on for uh, about a year. Paul weighed the evidence, pouring himself into philosophy, science, and religion. However, one book remained unread. 
up to this point, I'd been reading books about the Bible and other types of evidence for it, but I hadn't actually read the Bible. I was sort of afraid to read it, that it would you know, take me away from what I was now hoping was true. But through my studies, I learned about this passage called Isaiah 53, and I read it, and it was a picture of the cross. And I said, there's got to be a transcendent being above who has control of this book and knows the beginning and the end because there's information in here that only a being outside of time could know about. I began to see that the Christian scholars really did have the upper hand in this game. They had the goods. And it became increasingly apparent that the atheist side was a, a very weak argument was really based on the presupposition that the natural world was all there is. The tide really turned in favor of Christian truth. And at that point, I really formed the idea, I'm compelled to believe this. Alone in his study, while reading Isaiah 53, Paul asked Jesus Christ into his heart. It was a feeling, I would say, of trust and of hope. Um, because I was aware of a, a level of hopelessness in my life. So I would say that the, the part of Christianity that struck me first and largest was hope. Paul has been a Christian, a follower of Christ, since 2001. That was the same year he married Mary. When he talks about Isaiah 53 to others, he tears up because it's so powerful. The deep love of our Lord Jesus is beyond words for me. There's only victory in Christ. And both of us, if we're speaking about our faith, we speak about Jesus. So if Jesus rose from the dead, why did he rise from the dead? And the best explanation out of all the possible ones, you know, both natural and from other religions, was that the God of the Bible raised Jesus from the dead. Paul's book, You Bet Your Life, shows his investigative journey to Jesus Christ. Jesus rescued me, he paid my ransom, he paid the price. So in a way there's a debt I can never repay except to live for him. I think once you explore the things that Paul talks about, the things that Lee Strobel writes about in his book, it's very difficult to go back to being satisfied with just some truth. You know, all of life is filled with questions. And yet I have to say in my own life as well, when I got into the Word of God, I was amazed. I stood amazed, as did Paul, saying, where was this all of my life? I had always thought that reading the Word of God would be boring, that it would be very religious, it would be difficult to understand. You know, you get that old argument that there are so many different translations. Those many different translations all say pretty much the same thing. <laughs> if you've never explored the Word of God, take time to get into it. Many, many people have so many questions about the validity, but I tell you in truth, you will find answers. In truth, you will find freedom. Jesus said he came to set the captive free. We are captive to false teaching, to our own wrong thinking, to our selfishness, the self-centeredness that Pat talked about earlier when we were answering questions. But when you get into the Word of God and you understand how much He loves you, how much for all these generations He has been reaching out to each and every one of us saying, come, come, I'm here, come. Let me save you, let me fill you, let me teach you, and let me give you the gift of eternal life. It's all yours. You know, if you are someone who has struggled with these questions, I want to say uh, today's a great day, a great day to ask Jesus. When I made a commitment in my own life, I just said, okay, God, here I am. Here's everything that I have to give you. If you're not there, I'm no worse off than I was before I said this prayer. God will meet you right where you're at, believe me. So feel free to pray that prayer to Him. He loves you with an everlasting love. Imagine this, the creator of the universe waiting for you and me to be ready to receive Him. How unbelievable. If you've prayed that prayer, 
in your heart. Pat's got a wonderful packet for you. It's called A New Day. He's put it together just with you in mind. What do you do once you pray the prayer? I mean, what does it mean to be a Christian, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? This is yours for the asking. All you have to do is call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. But let today be the day you say, okay, I'm going to get into the Word of God. I want to hear what God has to say to me. Start with the New Testament, book of Matthew, and read through it. You'll love what God has to say to you today. Pat? Wonderful. Well, folks, that's about it for this program. Today's Power Minute is from the book of Jeremiah. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Well, tomorrow, we've got the man who went from jail cell to the State of the Union in just one month. The story of his first step back toward freedom. That's on Tuesday, 700 Club. So for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow, so don't miss an exciting episode of the 700 Club.